I'm going to talk about um, how I practice for two different styles. One of is one of which is jazz, uh, and the other is classical. Um, and before I start, I just want to say that um, I'm not going to get too in depth on the actual stylistic requirements of these um, these ways of playing because um, I think the practice things which I'm going to talk about we can apply to really playing any kind of tunes or even um, any kind of improvising. So if you've got a tune which you're playing on and it needs a bit of improvising, um, I think some of these techniques are going to work. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to play play a tune just so you get an idea of the sort of the way I play and the sound I make and everything. Um, and then I'm going to give you an idea of, of how I get there. And I'm going to play a bit of jazz first and then in a while I'm going to play a little bit of classical. So we just have to get see if all the um, see if all the technology works. So I've got my phone plugged in here. I've got a little speaker and I've got a harmonica. So we should be good to go. So this is the song "All of Me." One, two, three, four. Okay, so thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, how's it? Was the sound okay, Sam? Um, <clears throat> hear everything right? Good. Yeah, I mean, if, if anything, the backing could come up. The, sorry, the backing could, could come up 
a little bit more, but um, okay. But, but it's, so, it's, it's, it sounds good. Okay, fine. Good, good, good. So, okay. Um, well, that was all of me, and um, I was obviously playing it in a jazz style. Um, but I was. I'll, I'll just go now straight to a few of the um, points I was going to make about practice, and then we'll come back to all of me in a while. Um, so, why do we practice? That's always a good question, isn't it? Um, you know, practice is something that's quite easy to to, to not do, isn't it? Um, for me, it's uh, um, I tend to panic a bit if I've got something coming up, and I think, okay, I better do some practice. Um, but it's pretty essential to moving on with our instrument, and, I'm, and, and this sounds really obvious, doesn't it? But um, I think there are different kinds of practice. Uh, the first thing is what I would call um, general improvement stuff, uh, which is how we get, we get around our instrument. And um, we all want to get around the instrument easier just to um, put across the pieces which we're playing. Um, so the few things which I work on a lot are um, scales. So um, we all know the major scale. So I would, before I just play it mechanically, I mean, obviously I want to make sure I play all the right notes. I play it in every key. So I'm doing those scales just really to, to kind of work out the gaps between the, the, the half tones and the whole tones. But also I'm thinking about um, the kind of sound I'm making. Um, and I think this is like the, the once, once you've worked out where all the notes are on your instrument, the sound you make is, is, is crucial. And um, I was having a chat with, with Sam and Pete before, they are asking me how I got into playing harmonica. And I told them that after a few false starts, I finally met up with Tommy Riley. And um, Tommy was, it was quite amazing because he, he, he believed in every note having, he, he said, make every note a duel. To begin with, I thought he said, make every note a duel. And I thought we were like, I was fighting it out with my instrument, which I thought was very much the, uh, the way it felt. But after a while, I, I realized he meant duel with a J. So, um, and he sent me off just playing on the, the beginning of his exercises, um, his, his famous book he's written. I think it's just, just, And, and what he hit on there, and, and, I, and I'd play it, and he just, I'd play three, one note, two notes, and he'd say, stop, stop, that's terrible. Um, so uh, I've been to the mill with Tommy, let me, let me assure you of that. But um, yeah, he just said, you know, we're competing with um, clarinets and flutes and all the instruments where we're moving to the next note is... Uh, you know, it's kind of easy. Just they just they blow down a column of air and they move the fingers. Where we we've actually got to move our, our our mouth. So Tommy always used to say, you know, think of the next note almost before you've left the first. And that that uh, read stuff. So if I'm practicing the scale, I'm going to think about. I think about legato so much, the smooth movement, because as I say, we're, we're competing with vocalists, uh, other instrumentalists who all have the ability to make a smooth move. And, and I, if I, the number of times I've, done, I've worked on a show or whatever, and the composer just said, look, can you make that, make it smoother? So this is for me, the holy grail of, of harmonica playing is the smoothness. So if I'm playing a, um, a, a, a scale, I'm thinking of legato all the time. And, and, I'm, I'm, and I always feel I'm struggling to, to make it. So legato is important. Obviously, there's millions of effects we can create with harmonica and the, um, the staccato.
that's definitely one of the, um, the things we can also work out because it produces a lot of color. But I would say first and foremost for me, legato is is the is the main thing I'm aiming at. There's also the chromatic scale. Um, now, one thing I was going to say about practicing these things, I, it, it does seem pretty tedious. So I would think about, um, say that song, All of Me. If, it, if it's got that B. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I'm going to think about how, how one of my scales might work within that. Um, or even the chromatic one. <laughs> These, um, so it kind of gives it a bit of um, context for your practice and a, and a bit of meaning. And I'd put on the, um, I'd put on the backing track, which I've just played along to. Um, another thing, um, th these are all notes which are half steps or whole steps. Um, I, I look very closely at thirds. Um, so that's the, um, that's the, that's the second step, and this is the third. So I think a lot of playing, practicing in thirds, because the kind of melodies we we are, get asked to play, you know, a lot of the the the, the melodies, particularly their vocal, um, you know, have single steps, third steps. Um, I mean, Danny Boy. So in the, in that tune, there's all it's all um, seconds and thirds. There's there's there are no big leaps until it gets into the the middle section. So getting moving smoothly from note to note is 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 important. And I mentioned the the thirds there. So um, I would practice something like this, just just to just to really work on my thirds. And the I, I was saying to Sam that um, making these few notes for this has just really made me think. I need to do a lot more practice because um, I was playing my thirds just before this and I just thought that, you know, they, 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 they could do with work. So it's a work in progress. So here's the, um, here's some thirds. So that's in C, and then I try it. I won't do it in, in um, D flat because it's the same thing with the slide in, but uh, D major. E flat. E major. F. Um, and, and all the way up and, and it, it just it's such a good workout for your, for your brain um, take him really slowly and I'd also come down um, as I've just shown you another another leap which we get quite a lot is fifths Tommy Riley was an absolute master of those. <clears throat> um, it, they were clean as a whistle. You know, I, I can do with, do with work on those. One thing that I mentioned about Tommy, and I, I think you might have read this in, in place and I heard people talking about it, is um, his, uh, his request that you keep your head still when you play. Um, I think we've, most of us have heard that. It's, 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 I find it pretty hard to do. I, find, I look in the mirror and my head's moving all around. But when I watch Tommy play, he um, he was so smooth moving up and down. It was it, it's the one thing I can remember the most about going to visit Tommy, apart from the amazing lunches which his wife Ina used to cook for us. Um, maybe that was first, and maybe Tommy's playing was second. Um, <laughs> but um, have you ever seen in, in dockyards? This is a really weird thing to say, but in dockyards they have these cranes which they're like that. And they move along the dock backwards and forwards. 
all day long dropping things down onto the onto ships. Tommy's um, arms used to look like that. So he'd have the harmonica there, and his his elbows would just be completely parallel all the way. His his head would never move. It, it was the smoothest movement I've ever seen. Um, I can't quite do that. I've I've tried really hard. Um, it's a tough one, but um, it make it really does pay off with your um, with your playing. Actually, if you if you just try and keep move the instrument not the head. Um, so yeah, m moving away from scales and obviously um, anything with arpeggios. I'm going to play a little bit of Bach in a minute, and the um, arpeggios is is mega. So from arpeggios, obviously, I mean. So yeah, so that's that's um, if I was warming up or looking to to, to work on my, my playing, I would definitely um, start off with those sort of exercises, but trying to have them within a, a musical context. So um, let's just move on to um, other kinds of practice which we can do. I mean, those are very technical things. Um, so learning a new piece or learning a new style. Um, I'm just going to talk about. What I've done there, just to, to kind of um, put it out there for, for, for the way I, I like to get in something. And it's quite often I just get drawn in by hearing something great. So with um, if I'm if I want to improve my jazz playing, whatever, I, I've listened a lot to Miles Davis because I think that his um, his trumpet conception, as you as, as it were, um, really fits the chromatic harmonica. Um, I guess you could listen to a flute player as well. I mean, Miles Davis tended to play quite simply, which really, really suits us well as um, chromatic players because we can't run around the instrument in the same way that um, people like Winston Marsalis can. I mean, yeah, we can we can try, um, and and there are very few people who succeed. But for the rest of us, um, you know, that someone like Miles Davis is a great one to do. Or Stefan Grappelli. I mean, if I if I'm playing some um, for, for for the, um, the 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 concert which we did, um, which, which Sam mentioned, um, I uh, I listened to um, Anne Sophie Mutter, who is a fantastic classical violinist, because she was playing some of the Gershwin repertoire, and um, really it was yeah I could play some of some of the style, but um, the violin classical violin is a really hard act to follow. However, Stefan Grappelli has a more fluid style where, you know, the notes tend to sit next to each other a lot. There's less of the up and down pyrotechnics, which we associate with violinists. So I would, I've, I've listened to Stefan Grappelli a lot and, and I've got a lot of his, um, his swing ideas into my playing. Um, so, um, you know, looking at all of me, um, That, that's that's a style I associate with Stefan, and um, it's something that we can um, just just practice playing our scales in in um, in tempo with a with a, um, a CD. It kind of really I've done that so much, just playing along with CDs of my favourite players, and just trying to feel feel I'm almost in the room with them, and that somehow that their their feel is is going to rub off. Um, When we're talking about listening to other musicians, this is this is a big part of, of what I'm about because um, having played a lot of, as a percussionist and, and also as a harmonica player in in, in shows, um, I find myself sitting next to uh, some incredibly good um, players, particularly woodwind players, um, and and I really listen to their the way they they go about um, producing notes. I try and. I try and bring that into my own playing. So if you're a blues harp player, I guess you're going to listen to a guitarist. Um, so for example, you know, we think about vibrato and we know what vibrato is the, um, there are all kinds of ways of doing it. I tend to do it, I think it's with my throat. Um, 
maybe it's coming more from my mouth. Um, that that's the kind of vibrato I like. I have done the hand one, and that that's lovely. Someone like Tommy Morgan is, is creates an incredible sound with that. That's probably not the sound I hear in in my mind. And you know, having seen a lot of these woodwind players, I I tend to just try and do what they're doing. So. For example, um, a flute, have a look at the sort of flute. They have a very regular vibrato. So I might play a scale with trying to replicate a flute vibrato. So here's the scale. So there's no vibrato there. And I think of the way a flute plays a tune. So the, the flute players, they tend to introduce their vibrato really early on in the note. Um, and because because we're making up the rules as we go along as harmonica players, um, we can try different vibratos in different places. So we're not we're not stuck with the convention. I mean, um, French horn players in classical music, you know, they're really not allowed to use vibrato at all. They have to stick to a straight note, whereas we can we can pick and choose all these things. So um, Clarinets use use very little vibrato. I think I think well, I, I try and emulate the singers as much as I can, and singers will they'll establish a note and then they'll put vibrato. I stole that slightly from Tommy Morgan, who is um, I don't know how how many people have heard of Tommy Morgan. He's um, he was Hollywood's yeah Pete, Pete's heard of him. He was Hollywood's like number one harmonica player for for decades. He played a, you know the Rockford Files if anyone remembers that. All the way up to things with with James Taylor, and and I got to meet Tommy Morgan, and he just reminded me that you know the vo vox humana, the human voice, is, a lot of the time is what we're trying to emulate. So I I started listening to singers, and I, I they do establish the note and then hit the vibrato. So if I was playing Danny Boy, it would be. Uh, So the, the notes established, and then the vibrato in and Okay, so that's um that's kind of vibrato I might practice. Um, moving on from that, obviously there's the possibility of transcribing solos, but that that's a, that's quite a technical form of practice. Um, let's move along to the more in, more fun form of practice, which I actually I do, and I don't even call it practice. It's it's jamming along with a, a, a track. So if I'm jamming along with something like All of Me, that song there, um, I'm thinking about how the chords are, are progressing. And so therefore I will try and put in, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and cover the, the chords as they are. So um, it starts on C major. So I know C major has got C, E and G in it. So I, I might, um, the first two bars I might. This is also a great way of learning the chords. I mean, I, I've struggled a lot to memorize this, this tune. Um, the next, Chord is E major. I... Next one's E uh, A major. And then D minor. So this way I'm doing some arpeggio practice, but I'm also um, memorizing the tune. So I'll play, play a little bit of that. <clears throat> So I think we're back to all of me now. So we're coming up to C major chord here.
And then I might practice a few of the scales, which I did be doing. So I'm playing along and I'm kind of getting a bit of a groove going because um, practicing on your own does get uh, does get quite boring. Um, so anything we can do to spice it up. Uh, and once I'm doing those, I'll suddenly get an idea of putting in a bit of melody. So yeah, I think that's that's probably enough on on the way I would practice, you know, jazz or popular tunes. Um, Wait, Phil, can I just come in there? There's a question for you. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's from Bob saying, "Are you playing with pucker or tongue tongue blocking, or are you doing both?" I'm I'm playing with tongue blocking all the time. Um, so I make a little there's a tongue there, and it just comes out out there. Um, I have I have looked into um, Playing, playing with a pucker um, and um, I've played a little bit of blues harp and, and it's it's fantastic for bending um, but I find for me anyway I get a cleaner sound with the with the tongue blocking I mean um, that would be a tongue blocking thing where I'm, I'm I've, I, I can feel the um, holes really well when I'm playing instrument with my tongue um, That's the um, that's the pucker, and I, I, actually I think pucker is fantastic because um, I'm sure Stevie Wonder plays with pucker, and it makes it makes a really warm sound. Um, you can bend into the notes more easily. So that that that's I'm answering your question there, but I'm also going off on a little um, a little chat about uh, tongue blocking versus pucker. Um, I know people play in octaves. I, I've never really gone down that route. Um, probably it's a bit too scary, um, but uh, it does it does sound amazing. And I know blues players do all kinds of. Um, I'm, I'm sure Sam can tell me all about that um, afterwards. Um, all kinds of amazing things. But I stick to the, the bog standard um, tongue block. So um, yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about recording. Our, our practice, but um, maybe, maybe I'll talk about that a bit at the end, because um, I'm now going to move on to a bit of um, classical playing. Now, when I talk about classical music, um, yes, I'm at the moment I'm playing some Bach and a few other things like that, which I'm really enjoying. Um, but I, I think any any time we're playing a tune where we are um, playing a, a set melody rather than, than jamming, it's, it's it's a kind of classical music because you know, we're, we're using phrasing and, um, you know, we're trying to move from note to note as smooth, smoothly as we can. So, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to play a little bit of Bach now. Um, so I've got this Bach flute sonata, um, which I started trying to play on harmonica and I've, I've been enjoying it a lot. So I'm going to play some of this and I'm going to explain to you how the scales feed into this and, and any kind of um, playing of melodies. So I'm just going to rely on technology again. I've been asked to turn up the speaker a bit, so there we go. Um, quick sip of water. So I've got some music here. Okay, well, let's see how this goes.
so that's um thank you <laughs> that's great thank you so that was barks um <clears throat> one of barks flute sonatas for um just just transcribed for um harmonica um so what we got there is um it's in the key of e flat so e flat is where we're moving around a lot in that um I'll just look at the first phrase of that um, and we'll, we'll talk about, so scale of E flat. So here I'm just trying to, I'm going for a slightly different style. The, the jazz one is a, a, a dotted one kind of. With this I'm really going for um, uh, legato as much as I can and, and clarity of note. Um, there's, there's less uh, attempts to bend and slide into things. So the very first bar of this, um, I'll just hold it up to the screen if anyone's interested. Um, there we are. Um, so, so it goes from B flat to G. That's a really hard leap. So the first thing we've got to do is um, do what Tommy Riley said and move the instrument. Um, so when I'm pl playing that uh, B flat, I'm immediately thinking of moving from B flat to G. So all the practice I've doing, because I've been doing thirds practice, I've also practiced quite a lot of um, octaves. Because we're at a disadvantage as the flute player, all they have to do is move their fingers to get that leap. We've got to move this whole thing sideways. So um, that's the first, the first tough call with that, that piece. The next bit... Um, so we've got a little tricky, tricky moment there where we're going from D to E flat to F. So I'm pushing the slide in and I'm moving. So I'm going to have a really good look at that. If I play it through and I think I'm not really cutting it on that, I'm going to be um, practicing that slowly and then speeding it up. So that's the fifth hole, draw, then with a the slide going in and then moving up to sixth hole if anyone wants to play that. And then I'll think about a, um, a bit of a tempo. So I'm just kind of got a mental loop. Sometimes you can put on a, a metronome where it's going like that. And I'll probably might even write down today I'm doing it at whatever that is. Crotch equals 60 maybe. And I'll, maybe tomorrow I'll try and do it at crotch equals 70. So I'm really just trying to get as tight as I can. And you probably heard me do it there. Um, probably about two out of four were really good. One out of four was not great. So that's an ongoing thing. The next um, bar. So we've got some notes consecutive to each other. So that's going from um, B flat, A flat, G, F and E flat. So that they're my normal scale practice. Um, it's, gonna, it's helping me there because it's just that is just another form of a scale. So the next bit here. Um, um, it's that bar there. It's a B flat to a to a B flat. So that really is an octave leap. That's a really tough leap. So um, Tommy Morgan said, "Think of almost sliding into it." I mean, um, that's a, a you can't play it like this. But 
and then the next bit is just another arpeggio and the next bit is is part of an E flat arpeggio so there it's um it's, I'm seeing it backwards on the screen which is throwing me a bit but it's um, 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 um where are we oh yeah so it's those notes there so we've got a B flat going to B flat to a G and an E flat so the B flat the G and the E flat are just parts of the um E flat Arpeggio. So if we've been working our arpeggios. That's just part of that practice. And then moving on. There's three notes to the next phrase, which goes. got B flat arpeggio and E flat arpeggio so what I'm saying here um, it, I'm not trying to analyze this piece technically I'm just saying that if if I'm practicing my A flat and my E flat I practice them a lot because um, a lot of jazz pieces are in B flat and E flat um, that feeds really nicely into my playing of these classical things because they're so arpeggiated particularly Bach a lot of it <laughs> And this, this piece is so much of that. Bar 18 here, it's quite a tricky one, that one there. Um, so that one is... Um, so that's F arpeggio in another form, sorry, on the second um, note. So if we've been practicing, if I've been practicing my F arpeggio, that kind of thing starts to come a lot easier. Moving, so moving on, a lot of it is based on scales. Um, as I've shown you. Um, so I'm going to play another little bit now, which is the second movement, which is called the Siciliano. And now that, now that I've told you a few of those sort of things I practice, you'll hear more of those arpeggios and scales incorporated in the music. Okay. Um...
So that's thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I think I've covered there um, really how I think about practicing some jazz and some classical. And as I was saying, um, what, what I was talking about the, the classical music there, just it really does feed into playing of any any kind of melody where we're looking for smooth movement from note to note and phrasing. Uh, in that one there, I was trying to use, I was thinking of it as a, as a vocal vibrato, but I'm sure you, you guys that play with the um, hand, that wouldn't be nice. That, that'd be really nice. Um, now, I'm just going to ask Sam whether um, you want to ask anyone to make any observations or share anything with us at this point. Um, I've got one other tune. There aren't any questions at the moment. Okay. Um, oh, with these couple of comments. Um, oh, it's from Pete. Phil, you have a fantastic. I'm not quite sure what you got a fantastic of, but uh, it says, but the sound belongs to you, which is even more impressive. Oh. So I think a nice compliment. Yeah, lovely. Thank have you. said fantastic, fantastic sound, you should have said, sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks it. very much. That's, and that, that just quick, very quickly, I'll bring, talk about sound. Um, that comes quite a lot from um, fighting to be heard in, in pits where I wasn't amplified with other musicians. Um, playing a harmonica. I played a lot at the Globe as well, where they don't, they never used to use any amplification. And um, so, so projection of the sound was, otherwise I just, well, there's no point playing. So um, I suppose it's just, it's kind of accidental that, that the sound has um, developed into quite a big sound. It's not as big as Tommy Morgan's, unfortunately, who I sat in the room with and I, uh, I absolutely loved the way he made a big sound. He uses a square hole Hona 270, and he said that he actually forced his um, his mouth into making a square hole. Um, he, he really did sacrifice himself for his musical career, let me tell you. Um, the other thing is the blues harp players. I mean, wow, what a sound. So I'm, I often think of that that sound that, that that those people get when they when they play. I mean, it's a huge sound, and I just think, the one thing I hate is when people mention, um, talk of a harmonica being tinny, you know, um, I just don't think that's fair. I think, you know, quite often we're not helped out with amplification. Um, I think I just saw a question on the screen there. Um, is it how many, how, how much many do I practice? Do you practice? Oh, um, it, it depends what, what I've got, what's coming up. I mean, when I first started playing the chromatic harmonica, I was doing shows in the evening as a drummer and percussionist. And I used to just get up in the morning and start trying to work out how on earth to get a sound out of this instrument, the chromatic harmonica, because um, it seemed a difficult instrument. So I would probably practice like, you know, a good couple of hours, you know, just 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 working my, my way around the instrument. I've also done a lot of had a lot of gaps in shows in London where I've, I've you know, had a time off between shows. So I've done quite often had a couple of hours between shows and instead of going to the pub with the brass players, which I have to say was quite tempting, but I just thought uh, I, I'm only here once and I'm hearing some people play harmonica the way I would love to play and I can't. So this is going to really annoy me. So it has been, I have done two, three, four hours. Also, I go many, many weeks where I don't practice at all just because I've got other things, you know, taking up their time and my time. And so, um, I'm a bit of a golf fan and I was watching Podrick Harrington talking the other day and someone said, oh, should I practice four hours a day, Podrick? And he said, he said, you don't, should only practice for as long as you're engaged, uh, uh, which I thought was really interesting. So if I'm, if I think I should be playing the harmonica and I'm not really kind of feeling like it, uh, I, I quite often record myself. So I've got this thing called Audacity, which is a free software. And I've last eight to 10 years, I've used an awful lot and it's just been a, absolute game changer for me. Um, so or, say I think I'm pretty good at playing a piece. I will then plug in a microphone and play this piece and I will be pretty, quite horrified of what I'm listening to. Um, and I will hear that it doesn't sound at all the way I thought it was. So, um, you know, the, recording myself really motivates me to to get on and, and, you know, and then I'll probably listen to someone 
you know, really, really good on YouTube that I wish I could play like, and then I will, um, you know, might plug myself, you know, plug myself in and play back a few times and try and, and it's amazing how that, how that drags your playing up actually. So in answer to very, you know, I've answered that in a very long winded way, but I would um, try and make my practicing interesting by, um, by recording myself. So, um, and I'm actually trying to create something. So it becomes a creative thing because then sometimes I've, you know, I, I've got a, a track there which I can file away on the computer and say, oh, well, I'm really pleased with that. And, you know, I listen to it a couple of times and um, then put a bit of reverb on. Uh, and so um, that way, I, I actually feel I'm getting somewhere because, I mean, all of us, we reach a certain level and it's hard to kick on. And I think it's where, where, where you're trying to move from just getting around instruments, playing someone that people are going to like to listen to. So, you know, I, I would always play it to... I've got a very good pal who's a sax player and he sends me his stuff, what he's doing, and I send him my stuff. And um, he's he's usually quite complimentary. I mean, he will say if it's if there's issues of tuning or something like that. So I just try and bring in my practice into the real world and make, make, make it have a consequence where someone's going to listen to what I'm doing and it's going to, um, you know, have, have an effect. Um, so... That's a very long answer, wasn't it? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, a couple more questions. Um, I meant to ask this before we started, actually. Um, Ken is in the US and he's misunderstood the time difference. Um, oh. Are you happy for this to go on, a, on our website? We, we tend to um, uh, yeah, rec record each of these sessions mm. and then make them available on, on, on the website. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you think it's, um, you know, interesting, um, people in be interested, I'm very happy with that. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Okay, there you go, Ken. Um, happy customer, hopefully. Um, another one, do you use the metronome when you are learning a new tune? Hmm. Um, do I use much? <clears throat> um, if I'm struggling with it, I will. I mean, yeah, if there are little technical things um, in, in that the first bark thing I play, there's a few little corners that I can play everything else up to speed and then they, they struggle with those things and um, I will definitely put a metronome and, and practice it slower just so I've got a, um, a reference point from day to day so I know I'm actually getting better and it's kind of forcing me to um, get better and and what's interesting um, the uh, which one was it um, um, there's one bit which I really struggle with I still do actually um, That one there, um, I have to be really in the zone to get that, to nail that every time. Um, I, I, the reason I put, play that with a metronome and make, make a mark on the metronome is that sometimes the improvement to that, it takes takes quite a few days rather rather than, you know, the session I'm doing it in. So um, it's it's a kind of quite a gradual improvement and it can be a bit depressing, um, you know, if you're feeling not. So the metronome is, is quite valuable for, for a day-to-day -day thing. Um, in terms of uh, keeping going, I, I quite often practice to, not to a metronome, but I'll, I'll, I'll look for a, a backing track or a um, someone else playing the track on YouTube. And then it, it forces me to keep going. And it, make, it forces me to be really honest with myself because if I'm playing all, it all great, but I'm not playing that bar very well, um, then, um, you know, playing along in something that's a regular tempo will really show it up to me. I find a metronome a little bit soulless. I used to play, practice my percussion a lot to a metronome, like really trying to nail the right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left things. Um, so I guess I have a little bit of an internal metronome anyway from my drumming days. Um, but it, it's a, quite a useful pra practice aid if, you're, if you've got a technical thing you just can't play. Slow it right down till you can play it, because we can always play it at a certain speed and then just gradually notch it up. And, and, and it'll gradually improve. Um, okay. okay, well, this so, one from... there's, so there's a couple more questions, but I've got one for you, but it's about you being a percussionist. Yeah. Now, we're, we're lucky enough here just to have um, Liverpool Phil across the Mersey. Wow. Um, and what, what always, when you've got the per percussionists all at the back, the, the one thing, you know, and they might just do a, a some chimes or, or play a triangle once in the whole piece you know 15 minutes in as a percussionist yourself what 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 do you do do you actually follow the music 
or are you thinking, all oh, right, hang on, hang on a minute, <laughs> maybe it's coming up soon? Yeah, um, <laughs> the voice wants well, to know. Well, the way they the way they separate your you, when they print the part out, it has bars rest on it. So, um, like this 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 piece here, um, I mean, a lot of people will know this. Uh, wherever there's a gap, um, oh yeah, so. Yeah. See that? See that five there? Yeah. That's the, that's like the bars rest. So percussion part will have you know the bit you're playing and then they have like twenty five bars rest. So I literally sit there going one two three four <laughs> two two three four three two three four all the way up to twenty five and then after twenty five it has my bit and I play it and then um, but I, I got out of that because it's it, it's it's um at the same simultaneously um terrifying and boring at the same time if that's possible <laughs> yeah yeah if you lose count <laughs> i mean i've got to tell you i i used to dep on drums on miss, miss saigon in the west end wow. and um there was this um huge big ballad you know the night saigon fell or whatever dance like it's the end of the world so um the drum part you've got like 60 bars and then there's a big drum fill leading into the key change you know da 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 and then you're into the you know, everyone on stage singing. So I counted my, religiously counted my 60 bars rest, or what I thought was my 60 bars rest. And then I went, ba, ba, da, da, da. And nothing happened because I, I, I was actually a bar early. So I had then had the humiliation of having to do this big drama fill again. And then everyone came in that time. So um, there's nowhere to hide. And quite often I was in, I was in percussion, playing percussion in a West End show and there'd be the, um, you know the perspex screen in front of me screening off the percussion instruments because they're so noisy from all the you know and they, they might be the violin section in front of me and they'd be the you know the guy at the back of the violin section there's probably 15 violins and he'd be sitting there waiting to come in and then everyone else would start playing he'd start playing and i think oh my gosh why can't my life be like that where i can just you know someone can nudge me when it's my turn instead of i've got to take full full responsibility for making complete idiots of myself here so, um, yeah, so it's, uh, in some respects, then it's harder being quiet than uh, actually playing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, right. Have you got any other questions? Oh, it's Bob again about his, his, um, his tongue, tongue blocking. Um, do you switch? So, so do you switch um, from either side of your mouth? No, I don't actually. I know that people do do that, but I, I don't. I mean, it might be. Um, something I should look into, into for those octave leaps. Um, mm. I, I think people do do that. Um, I know, yeah, Tommy, Tommy did that. He played a lot of sixths and, and fifths and octaves with his tongue in the middle. So I guess he could play out of either side, but I don't do that. Um, no, I just stick, I keep it, keep it simple. And I think, um, I, I th I think it'd be too much trouble for me to re relearn stuff now, but I, I do admire it in people who can do it. So when you first start playing with tongue, tongue blocking, is there, is there a sort of, is it, you know, the, not etiquette, that's the word I'm trying to find, but would you, um, within all the instruction, will it say, oh, well, you must uh, tongue block, so you're playing the whole to the left, or mm. you, or, or is it just something that comes naturally and... Yeah, no, well, I mean... I, 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 I just read in a book that, um, you know, the way you start is, is with the chromatic like that and you look at, you know, hole number one below and, and it's, um, you do it on the corner of that corner of your mouth. And then as you move up the scale that that um, hole number two is coming out the corner, but your tongue is covering hole number one. Right. And you go up to hole three. Um, it's coming out of the corner and you're blocking off holes number two and hole number one. So um, I found that if I'm doing, yeah, so literally then you go up with the, you know, you're blocking off the, the two, two holes to the left with your tongue and playing the one out of the corner. And I found that, you know, for things like, you know, the third, I can hear, I can feel the, feel the holes with my tongue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just because I, that's become my muscle memory from having started off that way. Um, 
I don't feel quite so smooth with the, with the pucker. Actually, that didn't sound too bad, did it? Um, I think, I think, does Toots, did Toots use the pucker? He did. Yeah. There's a few knots there. Yeah. Um, so I just think the pucker works just as well. And probably, for, I just find for, for, for real cleanness of sound and accuracy of notes, for me, it works, the tongue blocking thing works best. But um, I played a bit of blues harp. Um, you know, and not not as well as you guys that play blues harp full time, but um, you can bend, can't you? You can't you bend the note with the blues harp in a way you never can with a with a tongue block. So it's kind of you got to do it, and it's um, it, it's it's a uh, um, so I think I think the pucker can be soulful. I think I'm convinced Steve, Steve, yeah, you see Steve Scott says he uses a pucker and it works fine. So um, I, I there, you, there you have it. Just out of interest, can um, this, this 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 is like being a school, a school assembly? But ha, can we get, do a hands up who does tongue blocking then? Just just to give us an idea. So so I'll just go across both screens. Oh, it's about it's about half. Um, so go on then. May, may, may as well do the other one. Um, puckering. Oh. Let's see, Sarah does both. And I was going to ask actually, who 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 does both then? Okay, okay and got to finish it. Who, who does neither? No. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's have a little look at the questions. Oh right, okay. Yeah. So so you mentioned about having to play a little bit harder and um, to compete with the with the orchestra. So the question is, how long? Do your harmonicas last? Do you blow? Yeah, how? Um... Yeah. Um, fun, funny enough, um, the reeds seem to last well. I mean, I use the Hona, um, the deluxe harmonica, which um, which is nice and bright sound. And I've also been using this Suzuki, which I think quite a lot of people use. Um, and um, funny enough, when I was first learning to play, my my reeds used to go out of tune a lot. Um, and I think maybe I was um, putting too much strain on the reeds. Maybe as I played more, I'm just getting more um, effective with the with with you know, some more efficient technique. Maybe so the 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 reeds last a long time. I find that the um, the rest of the thing, the vowels get a bit sticky inevitably. Um, but the actual, I, don't, I think the reeds stay quite well in tune. I mean. Um, you, so yeah, they last quite a long time. Um, Depends on how much you practice. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, put your two you know, hours a day in. Do you know Tony Danica? Oh yes, yeah. He's the he, Tony's he's a, he's a Hona repair man, and yeah. um, I used to send, be sending him harmonicas all the time, which cost me a fortune because I think he, he charged about fifty quid to retune them. So when I was learning to play and and, and making a real, you know, really struggling with it. Um, I had to send them up to him for repair all the time. I know I even broke the, um, you know, the spring on the slide once because I, because I was, I just played so much and he, I think he said that he'd never had anyone do that before. Um, oh, wow. so, um, I think as I've played m more, I, I didn't take that as a compliment, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's first for everything. Yeah, there you go. Um, he just said, Phil, he ran me up and said, Phil, do you do a lot of trills? I said, no, I'm just trying to play chromatic scales. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I used to break more uh, early days, but um, no, I, I really like this chromatics one, actually, the Suzuki. Um, I've got to tell you very quickly, um, while we're on the subject of harmonicas, I had to do something recently where um, there's this um, music sampling company called Spitfire, and they... Um, uh, they sample string string sounds, woodwind sounds for for film for film composers and game composers to use um, in part of their digital workstation, and I, and I got asked to come and do some harmonica sounds, and they wanted some deep sounds. So um, I looked into buying a bass harmonica, but they're so expensive, mm. um, I you know like a grand upwards. But I found this thing from um, Tombow, 
which I bought um, this thing here. And you have to play that with the pucker. Um, but the, um, the notes are incredible. Can you, does that come through at all? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. There's no, there's no draw note. Um, uh, where's the next note? Yeah. So I, I, I had to learn to play that. And um, it was quite funny because on the re on the recording session, um, there was a few people having to play instruments like um, folk, ethnic instruments, um, like strangely tuned accordions. And um, there's, a, there's a lady sitting next to me who was playing an instrument that um, she'd never hadn't played for 20 odd years. And um, the producer put her at, at rest by saying, well, the guy next to you is um, has never played a bass harmonica in public before as well. So. <laughs> but um, you learn pretty quick when you've, you've got to do it for some for money. So um, it was it was good. Could you just show us the holes on that base? Um, how they're configured? Oh, so this is this is specially designed for um, people playing in bands. So it's only got about twelve notes, mm. and um, the, so it's got like it's got the e e the the bottom e there, and above it. Um, and next to it's got an A. So the idea is you move, you're playing key of A. You know, if you're playing a blues in A. Um, so the kind of, the notes you might use are next to each other. At the top, there's an F and a C. Whereas I think a bass harmonica is like more more like a, a normal harmonica isn't it it kind yeah. of goes all the way up so yeah. this is a bit of an oddity so you've got um you know d and an f an f next to a c c's next to a g g's next to a d because if you're playing those keys it's like the fifth away so that it's like the, the tonic and the dominant sort of thing oh, well, so yeah i've seen one then but it's it's a nice toy though yeah nice. absolutely get out get out and play it for fun sometimes it's lovely um, what else is there? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I think you've half answered this question. And there. is there a chromatic you recommend, Phil? You mentioned, is it chromatics that you play at the moment? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the, 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 the Honer one is, I've, I've played that for years and I really like it. The, um, I mean, it'd be see if you can tell any difference in the sound. Um, well, that reads a bit funny. So that's the, the Hona, and this is the Suzuki. I think the, um, the Hona actually, um, it really cuts for those high high notes. I think you can maybe play it a little bit funkier as well. Um, yeah, so I've always really liked Hona. I've just um, actually what I like best about this is that the the slide seems to stay nice and smooth more. Because I mean, however much I clean the the honer, it always it just seems to get a little spongy. The slide, I, and I don't know what it is because I've sent it off to people and I've taken it apart and really cleaned it. Um, so I think, uh, do you know Paddy Byrne? He, um, he Paddy told me that he thinks that these have got a better, um, a much more efficient slide mechanism. So I think if honer came up with a better slide mechanism, I'd probably you know, really get on well with that. Also, because the, um, I think the reeds are slightly closer to your mouth, which which means they bend a bit a bit easier. Um, so, but I mean, really, those two are probably, I mean, how much are they? 150 quid each or something. I mean, I, I've got a um, one of the home owner Super 64X or whatever, um, which is a lovely sound. Um, but 
it's four octaves. Not everyone likes four octaves. It's quite expensive, um, but it's a very nice mellow sound. So, um, I mean, we you could do another poll, couldn't you? Telling people, asking who prefers which, but uh, <laughs> it's matter go, of taste. Go through every make and model. <laughs> yeah, be here a long time. It's all on YouTube anyway, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely.